You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers, Francisca Meyer from the Canine PT Academy joins me today to talk about some of the challenges of owning your own rehab practice. Here's one of the lecturers at this year's Vet Rehab Summit. This is our annual online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's happening on the 12th of November this year. Our theme is excellence, and we really try to tie this excellence theme into all of our lectures. So Francisca's topic is when your best wasn't good enough, overcoming criticism to achieve excellence. Now, if you're an online pet health member, you get free VIP access to the day. We also have three workshops leading up to the event. These are three hours each and they're all online. Online pet health members, you get a discounted rate for the workshops. You can register for these as well as the Vet Rehab Summit in the members portal. Now, if you're not a member, you've got three different options. The first one is become a member. The second one is to purchase a day access ticket. And the third one is to sign up for our free limited access ticket. Now, this allows you to watch one webinar and be part of some of the action on the day. You can find out more at vetrehabsummit.com. A quick word from our sponsors before we head over to the chat with Francisco. Choosing the right therapy laser and PEMF systems for your practice are big decisions. And that's why Response System has been helping to make that decision easier for over 35 years by offering both Class 3B and Class 4 lasers as well as a full line of PEMF products designed for both small animals and horses. All of their systems are fully rechargeable and adapted to international grids. You can find out more at responsesystem.com or come to the Vet Rehab Summit, Response System will be exhibiting at the online conference. So over to Francisco. Hey, Francisco, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Megan, it's awesome to be back again. Thank you so much. Now, we're all so excited about the Vet Rehab Summit, which is happening on the 12th of November, and looking forward to your lecture. It is when your best wasn't good enough, overcoming criticism to achieve excellence. So we immediately thought about you. We thought this is a great topic for you to chat about. So I'm looking forward to diving a little bit into that kind of topic and some of the other topics that we're going to be broaching at the Vet Rehab Summit. But before we start, won't you let the listeners know some how you got into the field and how you became a business owner? Yes. So I am very excited to talk about this topic at the Vet Rehab Summit. You know, I think some of your listeners, people who have been following me might know me as someone who helps a lot with business and marketing kind of stuff. But then once people follow me, what they realize, or hopefully my goal is for them to realize that how we view things, how we deal with things and our mindset surrounding different things around business, around money and that kind of stuff plays a vital role into us having a successful business. So that's why I was very excited to talk specifically about this topic at the Vet Rehab Summit. But just very briefly, you know, for those who don't know me, you know, I think this is like my fourth, maybe fifth, you know, guest interview on your podcast. So I appreciate it that. Is. In addition to the a few of the trainings we have available on your online pet health uh, membership platform. But my name is Francisco Maya. I am a canine physical therapist in Chicago in the United States. I have been working as a canine physical therapist now for seven years. And uh, for five years now, I have owned my own business. And that business started as a mobile business, me going to people's homes kind of stuff. But then in uh, early 2020, right before COVID, we opened our 1,300 square feet facility. And um, even despite COVID, despite all the challenges that kind of like came along with it for business owners, we grew and we have thrived during that time to the point where we grew from a team of three to now having a team of nine people on my staff. And then also just today, actually, we are finishing up our expansion at the clinic. So we're gonna basically gonna be doubling our square footage to just a a little bit north of 2,500 square feet. So that way we're gonna be able to continue growing the, the our services here in Chicago. And then in addition to that as well, I have another business called the K9 PT Academy that it just 
naturally evolved into when people started reaching out to me to learn about, you know, how to run their business in canine rehab. And then that's where I focus a good chunk of my time as well, you know, into providing content through podcasts, through blog posts, social media, and that kind of stuff. And then more in-depth coaching for any canine rehab therapist who who is just trying to figure it out this business thing and try to figure it out, you know, how to, to make it work for them. Yeah. And if you guys haven't already, you must follow Francisco's podcast. It's called the K9 PT business podcast. Is that right? Yeah. The K9 PT Academy podcast, business yeah. lessons for K9 rehab therapists. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we'll leave the description in the podcast notes. So uh, Francisco, I mean, have you always been entrepreneurial or is it something that sort of just happened? No, and that's a great um, that's a great question because people think that um, you know that we have to be a natural born entrepreneur. That either some people have it on them to be an entrepreneur, and some people do, don't have it. And I don't think that's necessarily truth because I went to physical therapy school and I got my first job as a canine rehab therapist with no intentions whatsoever of owning my own business. That was not my goal until the summer of 2017. So what happened is that little by little, I've realized that I wanted to do things a little bit differently than what things were done at the clinic where I was working. And then in order for me to do things differently, I was going to have to go out on my own. So that way I could call my own shots, basically. And that's where it kind of like came from. You know, but I I didn't have any desire to kind of like do so. But, you know, along the last five years, what I've realized is that I really enjoy that. And and that's what I mean. Maybe that sometimes, you know, some people connect a little bit better with being an entrepreneur or not, because it, it certainly comes with its benefits, but it also comes with its set of challenges. And I think one of the biggest things that kind of like people struggle with is just the unknown on kind of like what's going to happen with their business. How is that going to affect them? How is that going to affect their family? You know, because it, especially in the very beginning of the business, it ended up taking away, you know, some of the security blanket that we have over us in terms of like having a job. And of course, that can be very, very, very scary. But what I've realized over time by with myself and with other people that I have mentored is that, we can all develop certain uh, uh, beliefs, certain patterns of behaviors in our life that can lead us towards us being a, a better entrepreneur. And then along that journey, some people ended up liking that much better than other people. And then you can design a business around that, around, you know, if you want to, if you have that drive of being an entrepreneur, then you can keep pushing for growth, which is me, for example, I just keep pushing more and more. I just, you know, that's why we're expanding the clinic. That's why I have, you know, more than one business right now, because I've realized that I really enjoy that. It really, it really helps me wake up in, in the day, early in the day and like just have a sense of kind of like what is that I'm doing today. Now for other people, it's different. For other people, it just might be, I want to figure out how to have a successful business and how I can help dogs in my community doing so, but I don't have any desire to grow and that's fine either. And then you just figure it out how you can grow a business that fits the lifestyle that you want out of it. So the thing to understand is that there are different levels of being an entrepreneur and it doesn't mean that you either an entrepreneur or not you can be an entrepreneur who is more pushing the envelope who is more go 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 kind of stuff but you can also be an entrepreneur who is just doing something where they enjoy where they are able to call their own shots and and and, and help them live the lifestyle that they want to live both at home and at work yeah and there's such great points that you made you know if i think about over all the the um, podcasts that I've done interviewing vet rehabbers, I've met so many different vet rehabbers and so many on different paths with different goals. And that's one of the things is sometimes you meet people and you have vet rehabbers that are just content with what they're doing. So they have a clinic and they've got one or two people that work there and that's all that they want. And they carry on mm -hmm. doing that. They make a profit, a small profit, but that's all they want. And then you have right. other vet rehabbers like you, who are wanting to expand and it's just the growth and you just, you know, you've got sort of higher aspirations and that's okay. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you want. Yeah. I mean, making that transition, right. From being employed into earning your own business is quite a, it's quite a big one. What advice would you give to those that are in that position now and wanting to, to make that transition? 
Yeah, probably the biggest challenge that I had, you know, going back to that summer of 2017, you know, when I've realized that, you know what, I want to go out on my own, I want to uh, uh, go to people's homes and, and see their pets. Um, but I had like, literally no clue about how to go about any of it. I think one of the things that was really challenging for me at that point in time was that I didn't have any good, like a uh, role model, anyone that I could see online or, or whatever, or around me that was doing the thing that I aspired to do and be like, yes, that's doable. See, this person is doing, I can do that too. You know, so, so that's what I try to create to, 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 to canine rehab therapists is just being that North star, someone that they can look and see like, yes, this is doable. Like Francisco is doing it. So-and-so is doing it, you know? So that way it just helps with that self-belief a little bit more because I feel in the very, very, very beginning, that's probably the biggest struggle we have because we didn't go to school to be a business owner. I didn't go to physical therapy school to be a business owner. Most veterinarians that work in rehab or not have not gone to school to be a business owner. But then suddenly we find ourselves in the situation where we become a business owner and we have to develop this whole new skill set beyond just the clinical skills that we have developed on how to go about things and, and how to like figure this thing out, you know, and, and tying back up to the mindset, that's where then it holds us back. Because first of all, it's just something unknown to us. And then when it's unknown to us, we feel uncomfortable, we feel scared, and we just like, you know what, it's just easier for me to not do it for me to not move forward kind of stuff. And then the second thing then is the self-belief then is believing that, yes, I don't know this, but I can figure this out. Yes, I don't know this, but I can reach out to someone to figure this out, or I can look into these resources to that's going to help me kind of like figure it out. And then along the way, as someone works on their self-belief, then their confidence is going to start going up. And then they're going to start feeling more confident about, yes, I can do this. Yes, it's not easy, but I'm figuring it out. I am slowly getting more patience. I am slowly, you know, uh, uh, building my relationship with local veterinary clinics, building my network with other local pet businesses, and things are slowly kind of like taking it off. But probably in the in the very, very beginning, that's what I would recommend to people is don't feel like you are on this alone. Don't feel like I want to do this. I have this desire to potentially do this, but I don't know how to figure this out. And I have to figure this out on my own because nowadays, especially with technology, you don't have to figure this out on your own. Like, you know, you have resources that can help them out. I have resources that can help them out. There's other people that have resources resources that can kind of like help them out. So just figure it out. Where can you go for those resources and just then use those resources to your advantage? Yeah, great, great advice. I mean, during that journey and that transition, were there any other like false beliefs that you had that were holding you back? Oh man, like so probably so many. I feel in the very beginning, it was that more like the belief in myself, the belief that I was worth it the belief that I knew enough to be on my own kind of stuff and, and figure this thing out. So there was a lot of self-reflection. There was a lot of personal development, a lot of just understanding myself a little bit better. So that way I could, you know, work through some of those own like issues that I was creating. And then, you know, as I started working through that and then it got the point of like figuring it out the actual business stuff then of course there was a lot of self wrong self-beliefs around that too and probably one of the biggest ones that you and I have talked about uh, a couple times already is around money is around you know us being able to charge what we're worth at us being able to make money in canine rehabilitation. And a lot of times we just feel guilty about it. We feel guilty about charging people what we should be charging. We feel guilty about, you know, how that's going to make people perceive us, what uh, a client's going to think about us, what 
even our family members, our loved ones, our friends are going to think about us or uh, what our colleagues are going to think about us. You know, are, are other people in the field going to think, you know, oh, we're greedy or we're this because we're, you know, charging more for this and stuff. So definitely there was a lot of self-development to, to get my mindset around that because the reason why I bring out the money is because everything in terms of growing a successful business is going to trickle down from that. Because if you can't charge what you need to be charging because of any wrong belief that you have on yourself, then you're just going to get stuck. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to grow your business. You're not going to be able to have the time off to enjoy at home. Like you, and, and, and the thing that it breaks my heart to see is can I rehab therapists getting busy, you know, running their own business or, or, you know, either mobile or within the clinic, just having a busy schedule, sometimes even with a wait list, but still, not being able, for example, to go on vacation for a week with their family, not being able to take off time around Christmas or around a holiday to be able to spend time with family. And part of it, uh, a little bit because of the money situation, but part of it being because they feel guilty about it, because they think that, you know, that if, if they take off for a week, then they're going to be letting their clients down. They're going to be letting their patients down kind of stuff. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, in the very beginning for the first year or so, those will probably be kind of like the biggest things that kind of like I had to work through in terms of like self-beliefs and, and things that we tend to kind of like tear ourselves that are not necessarily true. Yeah, I mean, that mindset stuff is so important. I mean, are there any tips and advice that you could give to help people work through this? Because- And if I think about it, often we don't even realize that we have the false belief, right? You can just sometimes just be going along, not realizing there's actually a problem. So what advice would you give to those that maybe know that they have the problem? Because that's probably the first thing and how they can work through it. It's like, what did you do that got you through it in those year or two? Yeah, you know, I think the, the you, you kind of like briefly touched on it during your question. So I think the very first thing is to have the awareness mm-hmm. that there's something wrong because you can't make any decisions on how you're going to change your behavior, how you're going to change a pattern of behavior, unless you are aware that there is something wrong with it. So that's the very first thing. And that can come through self-reflection. That can come through working with someone with a business coach or a mentor, someone who can help kind of like you see things from a different perspective, like your blind spot, basically, because sometimes we, we tend to have, and myself included, a very narrow vision sometimes of what we can do in our business and what we can accomplish. And sometimes it takes someone that it's not you, someone who doesn't have that emotional attachment to your business to point things out to you, meaning your blind spot that you're not seeing because of your emotional connection that you have with your own business. So that's why, you know, even even today, like I still continue working with business coaches myself too, because they help me gain awareness of kind of like, what are the things that, that I'm still even to this day telling myself that it's limiting, you know, myself from, from being able to accomplish more. So awareness is the very first thing. And then what I tell people is that once you have awareness, then you got to develop the clarity, the clarity on how is that you can move beyond this issue that it's going on. And then once you develop the clarity, then you're going to be able to develop the focus and the, the, the game plan, the action plan on how you're going to change this. So is it going to be, you know, by reading some books? Is it going to be by working with a counselor, uh, you know, a behavior therapist or listening to podcasts? Like it all depends on what is exactly the behavior that we're trying to change. You know, then we can figure it out. Okay, how I can work kind of like around this behavior, because then once you have the awareness, once you have the clarity and the focus and the action plan, then you're going to be able to carry through it. And then eventually, you know, not, it's not going to happen overnight, but eventually you're going to get the results from it. But that's basically what I tell people that 
step needs to be. But it's all got to start with having the awareness on what is that it's holding us back. Yeah, and I think these false beliefs, they sometimes pop up again, right? So you can do all this work and then something will happen and it'll pop up again. And that's okay. As long as you just keep following your game plan and go through, you know, the procedure that you've created to work through it. So sometimes you might have to work through certain false beliefs more than once. One of the things we're tackling at this year's Vet Rehab Summit is also helping with confidence and imposter syndrome. And, you know, it's something that I've uh, suffered from. And the imposter syndrome, I don't really like that term. And I interviewed Tony Brooks and he, he mm-hmm. also said, it's like labeling you. So like he calls them imposter moments. I prefer that. Is that something that you've suffered from um, in the past, these imposter moments? And if you did, how did you deal with them? Yeah, I listened to that podcast and it was a great one. And I thought it was very interesting when he described why he called it imposter moments rather than imposter syndrome. And 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 definitely it's what you said, like this self-belief thing never goes away. Like it doesn't matter how far you're along that journey, things are still going to pop up and we're still going to sometimes let our own head get in the way. I think the biggest difference is trying to figure it out how you can quickly bounce back from it. So that way it doesn't hold you back, you know, but definitely I have dealt with it. And I I still to this day continue doing that. Basically every time that I try to push, you know, uh, growth, especially when I try to figure it out what to do next with my clinic, what to do next with my coaching business, there, there are those feelings of like, you know, do I have this figure it out or not? kind of stuff. So it is something constantly doing with it. But, you know, I don't think there is a a one, like a single approach that's going to be helpful to everyone kind of stuff on this, on how to deal with this kind of stuff. But when, for me personally, when I understood the difference between self-belief and self-confidence, that was when it kind of like clicked for me in terms of uh, uh, being able to bounce back a little bit quicker whenever I had those times. So in, in, in just very briefly uh, kind of terms, what I've realized is that self-belief is about the belief that we have in ourselves and in our ability to do things, you know, and being okay with the fact that we might not know everything, but we know how to find the answers you know, we, we understand our limitations and we, we know how we can kind of like work through it kind of stuff. So that's, you know, self-belief. And then we have self-confidence. And what I've realized is that self-confidence is more of a continuing. It's not like a dichotomy of either you have it or not, but it's going to oscillate on different days, on different weeks, on different months, on where you're feeling with your confidence. Are you feeling high on confidence? Are you feeling low? Are you just doing okay with it? So we are going to go through ups and downs with self-confidence, both in life, you know, in in general, but also definitely professionally, uh, clinically as a business owner and so forth. But once I understood the concept, that's what it made a very big difference for me because growing up, I was a very shy teenager. And I remember people telling me that, oh, you got to have more confidence. You got to be confident in yourself. And I never truly understood it. I remember thinking to myself, it's like, yes, I want to be more confident, but like, where do I get that? Like, you know, it's not like I can can go to the store and it's on the shelf and I can buy confidence. It's like, where do I get that? You know, and I didn't understand that until later in life that the confidence doesn't come from that. It doesn't come from any sort of external validation or anything like that, but the confidence is going to come from the self-belief. So we first got to work on believing in ourselves and then if we believe in ourselves, then our confidence is going to be able to, to rise, you know, and, and that's what for me, you know, and hopefully I explained this in a way that it makes sense, but that's what for me, once it clicked, once I understood this concept, that's what I felt it was very important because there are days that I have low confidence on what I'm doing, on what the next steps that I'm taking. I'm not immune to that, but even on those days, I have the belief in myself, the belief in my team, the belief on my resources that I can figure this out, that I can get it right, that I'm able to move forward. And as long as I have that belief, I know that I'm going to be okay. Because even if I get it wrong, even if I make a mistake, even if I fail, I can still learn from those mistakes and still keep working, you know, on, on moving it forward. 
So, so for me, that's, that's what really helped me. It was understanding that the self-confidence is going to come and go and work through it. But I just had to work on my self-belief. Yeah, I like that. And also, I think just knowing that that's normal the Mm self-confidence going up and down. I think, you know, we see all these other people maybe lecturing, maybe practicing, see them on social media. And we think that everyone's got it together, right? It's like this person just has it all together. And I really don't believe that everyone has, you know, I think that every single person has those moments where their self-confidence dips. And, you know, you can, you can hear this from interviewing and I interview lots of lecturers and that have researched and have got, I mean, amazing credentials behind their names, yet still, you know, they'll admit that they have days where they doubt themselves or something that they did or something that they said, and they have these dips in self-confidence. So just, if everyone just knows that you're not alone, like Mm -hmm. there's there's nothing wrong with you because you're having that, everybody has it. Um, Mm -hmm. you know and I think even you know all these actresses and all these people that are in the limelight that we think are just like super confident have it together I bet they also have bad days you know Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah Yeah. so just know that that's my advice for for those of you that are listening yeah and 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 along with that that's why I feel it's just very important to have a group of people a community of people that are along this journey with you, right? So, so having colleagues in this field that you can reach out to and having conversations or have a group, a community of people who, you know, work in the field of canine rehab, of animal rehab, that you can share these experiences because that's what you're going to see. You're going to see that even people who from the outside, you're looking at it as like, these folks are doing well, they are busy and this and their social media is awesome and this and that. But then you get to know them a little bit better and you realize that they're dealing with the same struggles that you're dealing with. Yeah. No matter how, how big or how small their business is, they're still dealing with basically the same sort of like internal conflicts, internal issues. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, every uh, Friday, so the last Friday of the month, vet rehabbers have like an online coffee meetup and vet rehabbers from all over the world come together. And it's such an amazing time. And it's one of my favorite things to do at the end of the month is on three o'clock Cape Town time. And it's exactly that, you know, there are people that join there that you think like, oh, like they've got these big successful practices and then they're there talking about the struggles and the struggles that they're having with the staff and this is what they don't know what to do and they're asking for advice there and mm-hmm. and then you realize exactly that like you said that it's it's not all plain sailing for everyone even though you think other people are, are having like life for them is just all planned and all sorted it's it's not so let's chat about the mindset of vet rehabbers. I mean, what is for you, like, uh, what makes a successful vet rehabber and how is their mindset? What type of mindset do they have to have in order to have that success? Well, I think there's a lot that can go to it. So I'm going to focus more because of our topic in terms of the vet rehabber business owner, maybe yeah. rather than the, 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 you know, the, just the clinician kind of stuff. I feel like with the, with the business owner, it's, it's two main things. One is what I, what I say, it's uh, feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable because mm-hmm. you're never going to get comfortable. There's never going to be a point in your journey as a business owner that you're going to feel like I've got this, I've got it all figured out. And there is nothing else that can throw me off. Like that's never, ever going to happen. But what you need to develop is your capacity to be okay with feeling uncomfortable. So feeling comfortable being uncomfortable, knowing that, yes, I may not have much experience in hiring, you know, using an example of what you just brought it up during those coffee meetings. I may not, you know, this is maybe my first hire and I have no idea how to do this but feeling comfortable enough that I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. And, uh, and we're going to kind of like go from there, you know, because one thing that I've noticed is that sometimes we tend to chase, we tend to keep chasing this idea that like, Oh, I'm good. I want to keep working through this until I feel comfortable being a business owner. And then, and then, then we never get there. We never get there. So I feel like we just need to understand that we got to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable. The second thing, is uh, not being afraid to failing forward, you know, understanding that you're going to make plenty of mistakes. I have made tons of mistakes, 
but you can learn from those mistakes and then try to get it better next time and try to get even better the, the, the following time, you know, and, and sometimes just the idea of everything needs to be perfect, you know, before I do something gets in the way. It's like, oh, I'm not going to hire someone right now, even though I am working 60 plus hours a week doing everything in the business. Because I wanted him, I want to have this full, let's say I want to have this full training process figured out for this new hire. Because like I'm a perfectionist and I know that that's what I want to do. Then you, you're never going to be able to develop that training process because you're working 60 plus hours a week. So it's understanding that it's not going to be perfect, but you can still give the support. You can still help guide that new hire. So that way that person can take away some of the load from you. And then you can work on developing the process with them, you know, in terms of hiring and onboarding and training, you know, and that's just one example, but it's just figuring it out that it doesn't have to be perfect for you to move forward. You just got to move forward. And if you make mistakes, wonderful, just learn from it and keep moving forward. And then the third thing is, Getting rid of this idea, this little bit of a false belief as well, that it gets uh, 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 propagated within the entrepreneurs around all sorts of different fields, so not just ours, that we have to be busy for the sake of being busy, that we have to wear this badge of honor that I am the busiest person in the building kind of stuff. You know, and, and understanding that that's also not a recipe for success because you can have, you know, have met business owners as well in our fields that have a big business, have, you know, a, 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 a team with like multiple staff members, and they're still working 60 plus hours a week. So then there's something fundamentally wrong with that too. And sometimes, you know, there are times in business ownership that we have to put our noses down and we have to figure it out and, 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 and sacrifice a little bit more. So I'm not saying that we never have to do that. But what I have noticed is that people just stay there. Business owners just stay there because they feel like it's where they feel comfortable with, because mm -hmm. they feel comfortable doing what they know what to do. You know, seeing patients for 40 hours a week, plus trying to manage the business for another 20 hours a week. And then suddenly that's taken away from time at home. That's taken away from their vacation. That's taken away their, their sanity. And they just become more stressful with the business, more stressful with their staff, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And they don't, you know, and once again, it comes to being able to see your own blind spots. They don't realize that. They don't realize that they don't have that awareness that, actually, they don't have to do everything anymore. They got to be able to let it go. So that way the business can flourish and they can have it, have a happy life along with it as well, rather than just being the person that needs to keep doing, you know, everything kind of stuff. So I think that those, you know, three things will probably, would probably be kind of like the, the biggest ones for me. Yeah. I think sometimes we are so opposed to change that we just keep doing the same things. And hitting our mm -hmm. head against the wall, you know, we know that it's not working, but the fear of changing things and doing something different is far worse than changing. And then when you do change, you think, oh, why didn't I do this years ago? You know, um, so sometimes we've got to be a little bit braver, right? And to take the, to make that change. Yeah. And I love, you know, what you said about um, failing. So there's that saying, you either uh, win or you learn. So you don't fail. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. So, um, in, in mentoring vet rehabbers, um, what are the major challenges that you find that um, business owners have that own vet rehab practices? I think that's a great question because a lot of it, it depends where on their journey as business, as business owners they're at. Now, for the most part, I tend to work with a lot of people who are just in the very beginning of that journey and really try to figure it out how to just kind of like get it going. And I feel for in those instances, the imposter moments, <laughs> not imposter syndrome, those imposter moments are probably the biggest things holding them back. And the, the fear of the unknown, the fear of taking a step forward without knowing that what the outcome is going to be from it. That's probably the biggest thing I see on the beginning, either someone who is just starting to figure it out like how to open their business or someone who has opened their business, you know, fairly recently kind of stuff. And then 
with uh, the other side, uh, the people who I work with who who have already developed a, a business and uh, uh, some of them are still like, you know, maybe just themselves or they have themselves and one shade of staff and, and, and a few of them have, you know, a team of therapists, a team of staff members kind of stuff. But the biggest challenge I have seen with those business owners that have come to me for is trying to figure out actually how to get clients, how to get new referrals to want to see another therapist rather than them, mm. you know, because they developed this amazing business, but people still want to see them rather than the other therapist. So they suddenly they have another therapist on the schedule, but the therapist schedule is struggling to get filled while they, their schedule has a wait list because still everyone wants to see them. So then they still getting caught on this wheel of like, I have this business, I have a pretty good business, but I still can't figure it out how to start detaching myself a little bit from it. So I don't have to be spending every day of the week dealing with things for this business. So from the other end of the spectrum, people who have already have a business that they have been running for a while, that's probably the biggest challenge that I see. Thanks so much, Francisco. It's been awesome chatting to you. I'm so excited for your uh, lecture at the Vet Rehab Summit. And we have some amazing workshops leading up actually to the Vet Rehab Summit on the 9th, 10th and 11th of November. So if any of you are interested, you can go to vetrehabsummit.com. You can register for all of those there. If you're an online Pet Health member, you get free VIP access to the 12th and a special discount to the workshops. And one of those workshops is actually how to overcome that imposter syndrome or imposter to moments and build your confidence and that's with katie ford it's going to be really great um so yeah awesome chatting to you and thanks for all your insights and um yeah really looking forward to what you're going to share on the 12th of november it's going to be great yeah thanks so much for having me very much looking forward to it i think it's going to be fun i think it's going to be fun to to not just talk about this but then get to listen to the other speakers at the vet rehab summit as well so thanks yeah we're really going to be diving into a whole lot of things you know it's 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 the first non-clinical CPD that we're having for the Vet Rehab Summit, although we have got three clinical CPD lectures which are recordings. And those, those are for those of you that I know some of you are like, oh, we have to have some clinical CPDs. <laughs> We've got those, they're recording. The rest of the stuff is all sort of self-mastery stuff and working on ourselves, which I think after these last few years of COVID, a lot of us have actually realized a few things about ourselves, maybe spending a bit of time with ourselves, we've realized, oh, these are things that we're struggling with. And so we're really hoping to help you guys out there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Meg. Thanks, Francisco. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. For more information about continuing education for vet rehab therapists, you can go to onlinepethealth.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course, thank our sponsors, Response System. They are as passionate about therapy lasers and PEMF equipment as you are about veterinary rehabilitation. They would love to answer any questions you have. So please feel free to reach out to them at responsesystems.com or you can email lisa at responsesystems.com.